Okay. Well, before we kind of start officially, um, many of you asked me a bit about my consulting services and my books and uh, the software, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on that. Not long. Uh, so my, my biggest book, uh, which is required reading for the, um, the uh, International and American Association of Clinical Nutritionists, is this book here, The Anti-Aging Encyclopedia of Tests. So this basically is my software in a sense, where you can look up about 170 different tests, what their high and low values mean medically and nutritionally, what supplements or compounds you would give, all of the things that my software does, but in a book form. And then uh, I published a book a few years ago on um, GMOs called Frankenfoods. And for those of you who are interested in intravenous nutrition, I do have the only published book on IV protocols that I'm aware of. Um, and then for those who are doing intravenous or the phlebotomy services, blood you know, drawing in your office, this is sort of a manual for your uh, staff because many states require that. And uh, the blood detected program, we talked about it providing food suggestions. It draws from uh, several different um, food plans. Most of those are in here along with 63 uh, recipes. So for those patients that just need to know what to eat every meal of the day, I finally made this. And uh, that's also spit out, but more specifically relative to the chemistry of the patient. Uh, in the blood detected program. And then um, this is sort of a primer on cancer and nutrition uh, where it talks about the synergism of different nutrients and the doses, uh, all that interesting stuff. And then I have this uh, little manual on, on gastrointestinal uh, health problems and um, nutrition. I have some other books too, they're on my, my website. Uh, if you want any of these, you just can email me um, and I will make sure to take care of you. And then some of you have my uh, master consulting services form. So I'm um, looking for five good people uh, to consult with me because I only take 10 a year. Uh, and basically, it'll tell you here, uh, for those of you who don't have this, just let me know, you can take a look at this. But um, you first start out with a three-hour conversation with me where we review the details of your practice, your goals, your dreams, your aspirations. We need to know where you're going, if we're going to get there. And then I help you design a plan to do that in terms of helping you structure, structure your office and uh, manage how you want to live and practice. And um, if you would sign up for that with here, uh, here today, then you get all my books for free. Uh, that would be my, my gift to you, as long as they last. And then uh, as we need any additional consultations after our first three hours, which we would, uh, I charge $250 per hour as needed. So there's no contracts to sign. You don't have to pay me big amounts of, of money down other than the initial because it is, uh, is very comprehensive. And I also mention on the back of this form that uh, when you sign up for me too, you get all of my procedures in terms of stomach acid loading and charcoal transit time tests and iodine patch test directions and probiotic uh, 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 stress testing and uh, I should say tolerance testing and a whole bunch of essential practice management tools which include all of the uh, the disclaimers, which I've had my uh, attorneys look at too. I am not an attorney, obviously. But you'd also receive my new patient forms and informed consents, which cost me tens of thousands of dollars to put together over the years. And as a seminar special, if you want to purchase my lifetime use of the blood detective program, it's uh, rather than it being uh, $5,000, it's $4,000. That's for all upgrades and all that, which happen automatically. You go online, you put your results in with patients. If you say to me, I want this change, that this test is not in there, I want this nutrient to be in there, I look it over, make sure it's correct, and then everyone gets the changes all over the, the planet that has that program all at once. So you don't make those changes, I'll make sure they're correct, you let me know about them, and that's how the program continues to grow with you. And then uh, for those of you interested in just looking at uh, the uh, blood detective uh, reports, I have samples of the reports up here, and I'm happy to go over them with you or send you copies uh, via email. Okay, any questions before we continue now with the seminar? Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. So our controller is over here. Okay. So um, we've already talked about this, so we're gonna move ahead. Now, adrenal hypofunction. Adrenal hypofunction is fundamental uh, problem with all autoimmune disease. You cannot have, autoimmune disease is a stress. Inflammation is a stress. Oxidative degeneration is a stress. Inflammation, uh, repair is a stress. So it's going to put stress upon the adrenal glands. They may, it may not be clinical, as I was saying during the morning, meaning that 
an endocrinologist might not agree that on a blood test there's something wrong with the adrenals, but before there's something wrong with the adrenals that's obvious, it's not obvious on blood. Just like, you know, someone will say to me, oh, well, there's no real evidence that that nutrient works for this. There's no evidence. I'm like, well, you know, before there was evidence for anything, there wasn't. So hang in there, <laughs> you know? It makes sense, it can't harm you. We know that at least, you know? I'm big on evidence, I'm big on the science, you know that. Uh, every page, every statement on here has science behind it, but science should inform us, it shouldn't dictate everything that we do. I mean, most people peg me for science guy, but really I'm very intuitive. I go with my intuition and then I pile this stuff on top of that, if that makes any sense. So. We've got adrenal insufficiencies that can be primary, meaning we have weak adrenals, or we can, might, might have secondary adrenal issues, which basically is what most of these autoimmune conditions uh, show, meaning that the adrenal insufficiency was secondary to some other process. When it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter from our perspective, because when we're using these sorts of nutrients, they're working on multiple mechanisms at once. They don't require that knowledge. Chronic steroid use, a lot of these people are on steroids, so they'll have a secondary adrenal insufficiency, like a real one, because steroids, like uh, prednisone, right, and these uh, tapering protocols that these patients are placed on, they cause adrenal atrophy. They co also cause low levels of DHEA, low levels of pregnen pregnenolone, even low levels of uh, cholesterol, okay? Very, very important. You can offset steroid use atrophy with just vitamin C. Vitamin C has been shown to offset steroid use atrophy of the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are the second most highly saturated gland in the body with vitamin C. Do you know what the first one is? The cornea, corneas of the eye. That's why oxidative stress damages them, but if you get the vitamin C in there, it's not really gonna happen. Or if you use, I believe it's the red colored product, but most of them have the phytonutrients are very visually protective, and we have other uh, products for that here too. Any chronic infection, any emotional stress, over-exercise, under-exercise, um, blood sugar problems, stress the body. Stress is mediated through the adrenals. Stress, stress, stress. Um, low salt, most of you have probably heard that people that uh, you can enhance their adrenal function just by giving them a little salt, okay? Licorice, of course, is fantastic for boosting adrenal function and being not just a, um, standardizer for adrenal function, but really can increase uh, adrenal function. Similarly to caffeine, except caffeine causes adrenal gland atrophy, where licorice builds it up, okay? The, the one major contradiction or contraindication, I should say, to licorice is, does anyone know? Hypertension. Right, hypertension. Although I've used it with patients with hypertension, their pressure went down, but that is in the textbooks, you know, so you just have to be aware of it. If you have a patient, once again, who's making you nervous, you might not want to use it, licorice, if they have hypertension. Okay. Yes? Um, the, what I've been told is licorice root will also raise cortisol levels if they're yes. too high. Of yes, yes, thank you. That's really kind of the point. Well, I was being too general when I said that licorice is good for the adrenals. It can help the adrenals make more cortisol. Now you're thinking, I thought cortisol was evil. It gives belly fat and stress and all that stuff. Too much. Yeah. Too much does. So yes, it, not only will licorice help the adrenals make more cortisol if it needs to, because right. it, it acts as an adaptogen at the ranges that you'll see in these products. So a lot of thought was put into the product uh, doses. But licorice slows the degradation of cortisol down, meaning it doesn't degenerate. It stays around a little longer. Yeah, so if you have low cortisol, it's a good thing. If you want to balance something out, it's a good thing. It's very good. Um, protein deficiency, malabsorption, or an increased need. You see that in autoimmune diseases. You see that in cancer. Let me, let me say it again. Protein deficiency. So how would that, might that look? Maybe they have a total protein on the blood test that's low, but maybe not. Many, many people will. If they have a low total protein, the total protein is made of the albumin and the globulin. You need the albumin to carry drugs along, and many nutrients bind to albumin as well. So you've got to make sure that, that their protein is adequate. If they're malabsorbing, uh, or they have conditions that are consuming a lot of protein, which all autoimmune diseases do, 
and you want to get that protein in there so that you maintain their lean body mass, which is a good thing for everything, right? We've established that. Have to make sure protein's there. Um, before I forget to mention, uh, whey protein, if you combine probiotics with whey, you double the, um, the um, not the yield, but the potency of the probiotic. So there's been specific studies where they've combined probiotics with whey. And it's, it's like you're taking a double dose of probiotic with whey. May, it may or may not happen with other proteins. I don't know. So the standard American diet, that's killing everyone. Certainly not helping. It's triggering all sorts of autoimmune disease. I mean, as a dietitian as well, you know, when I was looking, looking and doing different kind of hospital work, I mean, the stuff that we had to feed people, you know, on the menus, and you can't go out of it. You, just, you know, it's just terrible. Um, Good quality proteins, obviously. I've given you some examples. Um, avoid stimulants. I mentioned caffeine. S caffeine will give a temporary boost to weak adrenals, but it tends to cause that drop in cortisol uh, as well. If you drink coffee on occasion, it's usually pretty good uh, for a lot of things, actually. Vegetarian diets in general or vegan diets, theoretically speaking, if they're balanced correctly, I think are extremely good for people with autoimmune disease. They'll lose tons of weight. You'll, you can maintain their lean body mass, fat water ratios very well. It's a low inflammatory diet. We can go on and on why, it's, what's, why it is better. Um, healthy fats, the, the raw nuts, the raw seeds, the raw grains. People don't know that if you take a cashew and you roast it, it's an entirely saturated fat. But if you have a raw cashew, it's not. The same thing with an almond or sunflower seeds. Although I love those sunflower seeds at salt. Mm. They're so good. But uh, can't have those. <laughs> Maybe a few. OK. And then um, I just added this. You don't have this low cortisol um, uh, notation on your notes. But um, to lower cortisol, if it's too high, getting in the sun, vitamin D, walking, reducing stress, getting proper sleep. I mean, I just want to mention these obvious things because one of the things I give to my consulting clients is a lifestyle improvement sheet. You want to go over these lifestyle factors with people. You need to cover their lifestyle, just like you need to cover, cover their diet and, and not just supplements. I mean, we're talking about supplements here mostly because they are very important. And people, are, it's very hard for them to change diets, uh, certainly in the short term, not to mention the long term. So you, you make those changes as, as patients can. But nutrients, I explain to my patients, allow for for exacting amounts of certain compounds that push a process forward now. And I say to them, we want to squeeze the length of time it takes to fix you from this for years to months to here. And you can do that if you concentrate things so they act differently. And you can't get them reliably from diet. That's the, that's the truth, right? Does anyone have um, any comments on that? It's fine. As long as you agree with me, it's fine. No. <laughs> Can't agree with me. Um, also, uh, potassium is very important for lowering adrenal stress. Uh, the best source of potassium, I believe, are all of the powdered products. I never give them singularly. Um, they've got natural potassium. Potassium helps to upregulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps to regulate adrenal function. And um, eating, um, you know, often throughout the day, but not too often. You know, you eat, you, you know, you're told that maybe it's best if we eat every couple of hours. And that's probably right for most people. But that also causes insulin surges and other sorts of things. So I, I work a lot with people figuring out the best timing. And timing will be different based on their habits, what they can do, what they can't do. When are they exercising? How does the exercise relate? You know, if I give someone a protein for their autoimmune disease and then they want to run a marathon, guess what? Everything has to change. They don't tell, oh, by the way, Dr. Well, I, I dug a dish this whole weekend. I'm like, oh, did you take more protein? No. The point is, you, you have stress. You have to increase or change what it is you're doing. Like, I'm kind of uh, dealing with that right now with, my, with one of my sons, who's this big bodybuilder guy. And uh, I want to hang out with him. Otherwise, he doesn't talk to me. So I work out with him. And, but I'm running now because I love to run, and I don't like to stop. And I'm getting thin, and then I'm drinking all the powder, and I'm doing the thing. But there's only so much that I can do <laughs> so, um, before things start to break. So anyway, my point is we need to consider all the stressors in the lives of our patients. 
both physical and psychological and every other way to manage them. If they are, for example, I'll give you one quick example. If they say, yeah, doctor, well, my other doctor recommended I need a CT scan. Okay, that's radiation. So I'm going to dose them up on their powders. That's the first thing I'm going to. So I did a radio show on radiation dangers. And the thing is, there are studies, folks. You probably know this. Sometimes I forget who I am speaking to. <laughs> this is not the public. Uh, that show that you can reduce radiation biological effects with certain phytonutrients and antioxidants. They're all in those. They're all in there. So what I do during these shows, even though they're the lay public shows, I'm just reading the, the research right to them. And if you take these after the CT scan, even after up to about two hours, you still get the benefit. Yes? Are you just hanging out there? Eli? Okay, good. So I deal a lot with people's radiation exposure as well. They get all, you know, get all testy about that, as they should. So I go to the powders first, and um, what else? Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Doc, you have a question? Can I ask how you test for low adrenal function? Um, well, there's a number of ways. A simple, simple, simple way is urinary chloride. So urinary chloride will tell you that there's weak adrenals on some level. Then when you make that go away, everyone's good. So one of the things I set up with, with my consulting clients, again, are all sorts of urine tests that measure everything from um, oxidative malonaldehyde tests to iodine tests to heavy metals, the whole bit. And you want and just get all those, those done in every patient. So okay. we're expo exposed to radiation right now. You know, and while everyone's saying, no, no, I'll take iodine for radiation. So I imagine you're being exposed to radiation. So basically, you're a pile of dust, except your thyroid looks awesome because it's filled with iodine, and that's it. <laughs> what about the rest of you? So that's the rest of you. And in my pack of, uh, you know, like I have a bug out kit. Yes, I do. Uh, I have charcoal in there as well. Charcoal is very interesting. Quick note. It also absorbs radiation that passes through the body as well as antioxidants. It's incredible. And, and some of these nuclear power plants, the ones in Japan, I'm writing this book on radiation exposure in Japanese, and uh, that was not Japanese, but they have these big vats of charcoal uh, for good reason because when that radiation passes through them, it sucks it up. And I have charcoal bags all over my office, you know, EMF, you know, things everywhere. You know, you can't see, it's all hidden. Is a CAT scan powerful enough that you can measure it after it's done, how much radiation is in the body? No, no. We know that the radiation's there. Um, you can only talk about it in terms of radiation equivalents, like, for example, an average, an average, whatever that is, you know, CT of the chest is probably equivalent to about between three and 500 X-ray equivalents. You know, so it's, I, I realize that. But beyond that, not really. You'll see a, a spike in malonaldehyde levels in the blood or the urine, again, of which I give the powders uh, for my patients for those, because malonaldehyde is an oxidant that's released from cells that are under oxidative stress whether it's degeneration stress, inflammatory stress, radiation stress, stress, and stress. And you can measure those malonaldehyde levels going down, 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 down. And then they hit to a point and the patient feels a lot better. So you have to let these people know, your patients know, that they might say to you, well, my tests are looking great. How come I don't feel much better? If we can show them objective proof that they're doing much better, they might hang in there long enough for the test, the chemistries underneath, to catch up with how they feel. And I remind them, in, in the other way, there's degeneration, degeneration, and, and abnormal things that happen, and then they, it finally gets to a point where they don't feel well. It didn't just happen one day, so the reverse is true too. Make sense? Take, yeah. Yeah. We're talking about high, high about two, point, uh, 2 grams per kilogram of body weight on the upper end. But I mean, in terms of like just the practicality, are you talking redness, chicken? Oh, I'm talking getting the animal protein as low as possible in the diet and then looking at that relative to giving the appropriate you know, whey protein substitutes. Okay. So uh, Adrenomax, obviously something we want to use, as the word says, <laughs> you know, it has adaptogenic herbs. The list of them are right there. I love all of them. Uh, they have a lot of effects in a lot of places. And again, the licorice root is in there. You get the glycerizer, which is that active ingredient. If you remove the glyceritic acid, then you get deglycerinated licorice, which is safe in um, hypertension. Because it can cause this, what they call a pseudo-hyperaldosteronism 
if you take too much um, licorice. Uh, I've never seen it, like I said, but it's, but it's there. So you start with the suggested use here, and then you might increase. There's uses. You don't just use it for adrenals, but for hyper and hypothyroid. Uh, any chronic conditions, any stress, allergies, inflammation, mental fatigue, hormone imbalance, a lot of problems. So all of my patients are going on this. Everyone is going on it, except maybe for the, those with hypertension. Okay, everyone's going on this. I have yeah, sure. It, it was just about the disclaimers. Uh huh. It's a great book, but it sounds like you know it wasn't too serving or as directed by your healthcare provider. So that clear you like? Yeah, yeah no, no, no. It's crafty lawyers. <laughs> yeah, any lawyers in the room? <laughs> They're good. So um, for adrenals, the pro orange seems to be. Uh, something that is a little bit more directed uh, towards the adrenals uh, with the Panax ginseng, obviously, and the green coffee bean extract. Uh, some people freak with the, when they read about coffee beans, you know. And again, if they tell you they get all jittery from this, which they shouldn't, don't bother disagreeing with them because you won't get it anywhere. So just lower the dose, have them take it with food, eat first, then take the drink, dilute it out like that, okay? All right, so common findings with adrenal hypofunction, they can have low blood pressure. So, oh, yeah, my doctor said it's great, I have low blood pressure. Of course, I almost want to fall on my face every time I stand up. It may be too low, so you can tonify that. You need blood pressure to perfuse organs with nutrition, oxygen, blood. If it's too low and a person's, if they have low blood pressure, they're not exercising, they're not fit, there's a problem. I saw a woman just a few days ago, she says, yeah, uh, I listened to her heart, I felt she was bradycardic and her, her EKG looked bradycardic. And I said, uh, she said, yeah, I showed it to my doctor. He's not worried uh, because he says it's like an athlete. I said, so when's the last time you worked out? She says, I can't, I can't remember. I'm like, well, that's not good for you. I mean, if it were me, it would be different. But with her, it's not okay. So, you know, we need to give her the CoQ10s and the, and the Hawthorns and the stimulants for cardiac function and adrenal function to pump that stuff up. Sensitivity to sunlight, uh, drop in systolic blood pressure from recumbent to standing, so this orthostatic hypotension. Person gets up, they're kind of like that. I sometimes get dizzy too, so uh, because my blood pressure is very low, so I try to stand up a little more slowly. I only do that half the time. <laughs> and the other half, I'm dizzy. But it goes away. <laughs> uh, sluggish Achilles tendon reflex, so if you take the reflex uh, hammer and you hit it on the back of the Achilles, it's just slow. So slow reflexes, hypoadrenals, that goes together with that, and a person is uh, sick often, they're fatigued, they got brain fog, they have low thyroid, they have bone loss, low immunity, or hyperimmunity. You need, they, also, they all need adrenal function. Most of the public seems to know that. Or do your patients kind of get the adrenal thing? Most of my patients do. Some patients don't, but um, then you have to explain how important it is. Um, so what do I want to mention here? Adrenal Max is an ergogenic aid. It is um, pro-anabolic, so it helps maintain lean body mass through a lot of different mechanisms. The herbs have anti-infectious effects, anti-cancerous effects. They're radioprotective. They're chemoprotective. They're tissue reparative. So this is everything. They're antiviral. They're antibacterial. They're antifungal. I don't see it. Some things I've repeated, but um, there's, there's just no reason why these people should not be on this particular product here. And this we're going to skip. OK, any, uh, before we move on to the next section, any input, questions, concerns? So, all good? Do you, um, everyone here, use the Adrenal Max product? Yeah, that's just a sea of uh, hands. I'm just curious. OK. All right, so cardiovascular disease. So, what's that doing in an autoimmune seminar? Oh, and um, actually, by the way, Jamie, if you could let me know when the last like, hour is, that'd be great. OK. So cardiovascular disease has many aspects of autoimmunity, but don't ask a cardiologist that, because he or she will look at you like you have two heads. Um, but it does. So basically, like any tissue, the artery wall can break down. And as it breaks down via inflammation, what then follows? Cholesterol, Cholesterol yes, and calcium. So I did a whole show on, on calcium. Calcium dysmetabolism. Anywhere inflammation goes, calcium goes. Calcium just hardens everything. You know, and in the, auto, in the case of autoimmune disease, in all the wrong ways, like arteries. So in my office, I check, I do a test that checks the average um, 
well, it tells me the biological age of my patient's uh, circulatory system by measuring the arterial stiffness. So it's an arterial stiffness test. So I can show that when I'm giving them chelators or I'm giving them fish oil or we're talking exercise and diet, that I can prove to them that those arteries are becoming more elastic and more flexible. So they don't have to just take my word for it. I love doing that test because it's a biomarker of overall well-being. Because if you have arteries that are stiff and you soften them, you're basically softening up all cells. And cells that are softer work better. Right? Right, John? Very good. <laughs> okay, so omega-3 fatty acids and inflammation and autoimmune disease. This was the journal of the American College of Nutrition. And um, they talk about the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids and their, their potent immunological properties. Some of the omega-3s are thought to work by modulation of the eicosanoids. So it, they make the PG3s, which are these eicosanoids that promote uh, anti-inflammatory behaviors in the body. And then other signaling pathways and transcription factors and gene expression. The ways in which omega-3 fats affect overall health and well-being is just extraordinary. So in my opinion, everyone should be on them. The contraindication to starting a new patient of omega-3s might be which patients on what medications? Blood thinner medications, right? Like aspirin uh, or Coumadin, which is warfarin, okay? And if you give people those these nutrients when they're taking them, that's fine, but you better have them sign a release and informed consent, which should be at the end of your supplement checkoff sheet, or whatever you use, that they sign. And it also says in that disclaimer that this disclaimer with your signature and date will serve as a disclaimer for all future recommendations, right? Because if you forget, they don't sign it next time, they lose it, not good. Very important. And then you also say, I'm giving you some of the meat here, you say, and if any aspect of this, this agreement or these statements are deemed uh, incorrect or not permissible, all other aspects remain in force. In other words, if something's wrong and a judge says that's no good, the whole thing is bad. Not if you have that statement, okay? It's important to know these things. So obviously inflammatory disorders, autoimmune diseases, and cardiovascular disease. So coronary heart disease, depression, omega-3 fats have been studied very well in depression, aging in general, many different cancers. They talk about how it lowers, omega-3s lower the pro-inflammatory cytokines. It goes on and on about those details right there. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a huge fan of omega-6s. I stay away from them. There's a little bit here and a little bit there. As long as the omega-3s are much higher, I'm good to go. So let's just jump to some of the testing in cardiovascular disease, which really is also true for all the uh, autoimmune diseases. C-reactive protein we mentioned earlier. It really should say C-reactive protein cardio. Uh, that is the most sensitive inflammatory marker. Ways of lowering that would be to give the patient what they need for what they need, right? Whatever they need for what they need will lower that. But if you, you know, you really want to put your hand around my neck and say, what do I give them? Just make it simple. You give them lipoic acid, give them NAC, you give them all the antioxidants, vitamin E. Those are things that have been well studied for lowering C-reactive protein that's elevated from pretty much any cause. But vitamin E also has contraindications to the blood thinners, okay? And why would that be? I thought that vitamins don't work. Well, so why are we worried? Why are we worried? <laughs> Homocysteine um, promotes vascular injury. Homocysteine is a dangerous chemical, floats around, and it just irritates everything. If it irritates the brain stem in an area called the substantia nigra, you're gonna get Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. If it causes inflammation of your blood vessels, then you get arterial sclerosis. If it uh, irritates your kidneys in such a way, you'll get renal cell carcinoma. You name it. There's dozens and dozens of diseases related to high homocysteine and high C-reactive protein. This may be a little bit of an overshare, but C-reactive protein is not dangerous. It will be elevated in all these conditions, but it's actually kind of like a, um, a sack. You know, it, it picks up inflammatory debris. So the more inflammatory damage there is, there's more CRP. You actually want CRP. Now, that might sound like a contraindication because I just said, here's how you lower CRP. You take lipoic acid, you take the powders, you take the E, blah, blah, blah. But those nutrients fix the tissues so your liver 
and possibly your intestinal tract makes less CRP because it doesn't need CRP to clean up the damage. And then the C-reactive protein binds to the, the damaged debris and dumps it in the lymphatic system. How convenient is that? Uh, that was crazy when I first learned about that. Uh, I was like, wow. So the distinction there is interesting. So, and then of course, obviously with cardiovascular disease, we want a, uh, a VAP panel, which is a lipid panel that contains not just like, like total LDLs, but it breaks down the types of LDLs, large particle LDLs, small particles LDLs, small particle HDLs, HDL1, HDL2, HDL3, things like that, if you care to do those. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have to really go into that, but uh, hmm, I'll just say this. LDL, the total LDL is the total of two types, large and small. If you have a blood vessel and it's got cells together but they're getting leaky, the small LDLs, they can stick in there real easily, right? And they, they cause all this inflammatory thrombotic degeneration. The large ones, too big, don't fit in. So when you use nutrition to help someone, you want to see their large particles increase and the small particles decrease. The total tells you nothing, which is why 60% of people who get cardiovascular disease drop dead with normal lipids. Thank you. Yes, most labs will actually say on the report that the uh, LDL is um, normal at 130, but optimal 100 and less. Now, that's nice, but still means nothing. Because it could be lower, but it could be all made of small particles. So um, the nutrition really moves these particles around. I don't even do these tests anymore because they take a long time, they're expensive, sometimes insurance doesn't cover, and I've done enough of them to know it always works. So I give the right nutrition, which is count honorable for that, which are the things we're talking about. So the omega-3 D2 is vitamin D, you got a thousand there, you got the omega-3s, the EPA and the DHA, which is what you want, and um, with omega-3s and vitamin D work, again, much better together. And when we're talking about cardiovascular disease, I think we're all familiar, <laughs> that um, low levels of vitamin D are inversely related to all cause morbidity and mortality, particularly from cardiovascular disease. So in other words, if you have low vitamin D, your risk of dying of anything is very, very high. Okay? So I did want to mention several things, though, that the materials on this particular product do not talk about. The combination of omega-3s and Ds uh, uh, together is very interesting. Nocturnal enuresis. So studies have shown that the combined use of omega, omega-3 and D reduced the number of, of uh, you know, bedwetting events of children. Simple to take, too. Overall, vitamin D and omega-3s uh, acids co-supplemented for six weeks among gestational diabetic patients had beneficial effects on their glucose, their insulin resistance, um, their insulin sensitivity, their triglycerides went down, their LDLs went down, their ACLs went up, the total cholesterol went down with the combination. So there's something special about that. Um, vitamin D enhances omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid induced apoptosis in breast cancer cells. So omega-3, no, I love these studies. They'll say, they'll start out by saying, so okay, we all know that omega-3s kill cancer cells. And then they start, I'm like, hold it, wait, what? No, no, wait a second. I, I thought these things didn't work, but they state like, yes, the literature shows it works. Okay, so that's what I love, number one. The denial <laughs> is there. So we know omega-3 is anti-cancer for breast cancer. If you add vitamin D, it works even better. Okay. And of course, vitamin K, some of you are thinking, I'm, I'm connecting with you. Vitamin K2, very important, K1 as well. Um, a body composition shows the person's lean body mass improves. If lean body mass improves and is maintained, people live longer. So that's why, another reason why body composition tests are important to do. Inflammation, which is obviously partly controlled by omega-3s and vitamin D, causes a release of proteolytic enzymes. You don't have these, this exactly like this. I cleaned it up a little bit. So inflammation involves these endogenously released proteolytic enzymes. You can reduce the number of these proteolytic enzymes, to say this in English, with the proper amount of omega-3s and vitamin D, and of course turmeric, and all of those phytonutrients in the powders. That's what I'll say about that. 
And in terms of periodontal disease, we've hit on this topic already that uh, periodontal problems in the mouth, uh, gingivitis, is associated with cardiovascular disease. If you've got the seeding and the translocation of these bacteria, and who knows what else that's making their way in circulation, it gets stuck on the valves, causing these vegetative lesions on the valves, which uh, by the time you find out that someone has these things, the valves are like destroyed. You know, so it's, it was, it's a real problem. And then there's everyone else, um, which probably, who knows, so much of what we see and our offices may be from the leaking from the mouth. Again, everyone's talking about leaky gut, leaky mouth. That's the, that's the new, the green, that's the something or other. Anyway. And then, uh, so the endocrine tincture is uh, what we're using for that, that um, mouthwash. And that's that. In terms of laboratory, we talked a little bit about CRP already. I won't mention much more about that. We talked about homocysteine. We talked about doing a VAT panel, which consists of a total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDLs 2 and 3, LDLs, large and small, and some other things. Um, so much of the population, you know, in terms of triglycerides, those are the fatty, fatty molecules that happen to be the ones that reflect the sugar connection. So people will tend to have insulin resistance that have high triglycerides. So you need to manage that, obviously, um, for the triglycerides to go down. So much of the population within the United States have elevated amounts of triglycerides in the blood, which are primarily composed of three fatty acids linked together. So the dietary changes, these are just generalized, obviously. Avoid refined carbohydrates and sugars. Anything white, all alcohol. Cut back on meat and dairy products. Yes, sir. Mouth, Chris, are you using the endocrine tincture, microgon, or both? You can use both. Um, the endocrine one is the one that I'm really the most excited about. But um, both of them, I really should be recommending both. Thanks for even suggesting that, because it covers even a larger amount of organisms. And then a high fiber diet, obviously, fruits, beans, oats, possibly gluten. If someone's gluten sensitive in any way, how do you know? You give them gluten and something goes wrong. Um, the testing is not that accurate, but we'll see in a little while what that means. Then there's uh, the Control uh, 2 product, which has a number of different uh, uh, nutritional compounds, including uh, fenacreek and L-theanine and rhodiola and L even L-tryptophan that have been shown to help uh, reduce cravings and uh, reduce insulin resistance, lower triglycerides, total cholesterol levels. There's the frontier fiber. Obviously, fiber is going to slow down the transit time, which is going to slow down the time it takes for our foods to um, break down and release uh, glucose into the system, right? And as is eating on a more or less regular basis. Of course, it depends on what they're eating. And um, there's a cholesto, uh, cholesto red product, which uh, contains chromium polynicotinate. That is the preferred form. Um, glucose tolerance factor is a very important factor involved in insulin function. And it is promoted with this particular type of chromium. Uh, the red rice yeast obviously has been around a while. This particular product, I believe, for two capsules has 600 milligrams you want to get into the 3,000 milligram range if you're only using red rice yeast. But this has all the synergists, so you don't need that much. So follow the directions on the bottle, stick with that, possibly double it. But remember, synergism allows a dramatic reduction in the, uh, the dose needed. And then you get all the benefits of everything else, the Google lipids, the autochoke extract, the, the polycosinols. The polycosinols, you know, um, they block cholesterol reabsorption. I mean, that's a big deal. Someone asked me if there's one thing that I would think of for you know, uh, a replacement for statins, it would be the polycosinols, or it would actually be this product, because the synergism is just better than any one thing. The astaxanthin affects both sucrose-induced elevations of blood pressure and insulin resistance, which will show up sometimes as high triglycerides, and there's a liquid uh, form of that here with vitamin D. This is no longer available. OK. And then um, I wanted to mention that in cardiovascular disease, you might not think of enzymes right away, but enzymes reduce inflammation. Enzymes eat up abnormal antibodies. And enzymes, by being anti-inflammatory, help cells unstick. They help platelets unstick. And they help red blood cells unstick. And this is very easy to see under a microscope. You can actually just see as you give people the enzymes, their cells just start to come apart. It's pretty amazing. And um, 
Just animal products. So again, uh, my, my uh, advice to patients is we're in decreasing you know, animal-based products, period. And uh, we're increasing some other uh, advantageous foods here, like garlic, obviously, and onions. But even garlic and onions, you don't want to make dramatic increases if they're on blood thinners, because that can be a problem. They'll start bleeding a bit. They can also start you know, bleeding or bruising easily because they're vitamin C deficient. Okay, so that's a common one, actually. And they'll think, oh, no, no, it's the, the omega-3 you gave me yesterday. It doesn't work that fast. Sorry. It doesn't work. Okay, it's, it's, so stop. <laughs> yes, Eli? What if they said they had nosebleeds from taking vitamin C? Yeah, I say stop snorting it. Um, <laughs> okay. So, because uh, <laughs> that'll do it. Um, not that I know. I was told by someone. Uh, so they're taking capsules to see, and they're saying that's happening. So, um, you know, some people do have these reactions. I could make up some reasons, you know, why GMO, that happens. GMO. Not here. We, we, this is from beets, right, Jamie, uh, the, the source. So, you know, it's not GMO. Yeah, they, you know, they get a vitamin right. C off the shelf somewhere. And right. Them it could be. I mean, it's, I'm not aware of any uh, anticoagulant properties of GMOs but uh, it's just the opposite, actually, it's more coagulation stuff. But it could be, so I don't know. You know, sometimes we just have to say, okay, well, that's something we don't want to happen again, so let me help you pull that out of your nose, and then don't do that again. <laughs> yes. So um, I think, Mike, you're asking, okay, what do I think in general about those drugs as opposed to the ones that we're using now? I don't know if they've been used enough. All I know is um, I look at the labs, I see what the patient's doing. If I don't know the drugs, or even if I think I know the drugs, I'm going to look them up again. I'm going to make sure I know all the drug nutrient interactions. I'm going to check my blood detective report to see if it identified any drug nutrient interactions. And I just avoid those that are there. And um, you know, so I'm not sure if that answers. But does that sort of get in that area? Coagulation is like one of the hardest things in medicine to manage, particularly in a hospital setting. I mean, you're lucky if you survive it because the, the balance between coagulation and anticoagulation is just very difficult. Although we're going to be speaking about natokinase uh, very soon, I might as well mention it now. You know, natokinase is a, uh, it breaks up fibrin, it's fibrinolinic. And uh, this stuff really works. You know, when I find a thing that really works, I say it really works. Like, there's all these claims made on supplements all the time. But if you want to properly re reduce clotting and thin someone's blood, and that's your goal, Natokinase will work. If you give them enough, it will work. You want to throw in some turmeric and piperine in there as well, oh yeah, it's going to work. It's going to work really fast, within, within days to maybe a couple of weeks, um, without any adverse side effects for that patient, because it doesn't push the body so far in the opposite direction like anticoagulants do, you see. And then the, you know, so, so the nutrients are much more regulatory. The medications are, are just, they're not. They're just not. And then again, we have, we've mentioned this before, curcumin and, and piperine. And they looked at obese mice, the poor things, and uh, under caloric restriction. So not only were they obese, they didn't feed them that much. And then they basically gave them just curcumin to eat all day long. <laughs> but hey, they uh, lost a lot of weight. And um, compared to the other groups, the, those that underweight the caloric restriction and got the curcumin and piperine lost a lot of fat. So all of my patients now that are over fat or just o overweight and obese. So in other words, if I do a body composition on a patient and they're over fat, but they look thin. It's just the person says to me, yeah, doctor, well, I weigh the same I did in college. I said, yeah, but you're 90% fat now. And you're 10% weight, <laughs> you know, it was the total opposite. So how do you know? So um, curcumin piperine, it's so good for helping the shift in this balance. Maybe because of the anti-inflammatory effects. Maybe it improves the insulin resistant effects. There's so many ways that it works. So I want to put this on people, you want to tell them why it's that. Then when you give them the bottle, you write on top fat burner or something. So they'll never stop taking it. They'll never run out of it. And they'll, they'll like patients are texting me now, I'm going to run out in two days. I'm like, OK. So that's what you want. You want raving fans out of these patients so we can help them. So the combination of curcumin and piperine, that's what you need. And it's particularly good in metabolic syndrome, which is a condition, as you all know, which is a combination of hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, and what's the other one? High blood pressure, okay, which are all kind of connected. So simple to fix that condition in almost every way, and it is a mystery you know, in traditional medicine. So the natokine plus, uh, which again has uh, natokinase and uh, 
the other, this other very long sounding, a sur, sur, I never can pronounce it, seratiopeptidase, along with bromelain and rutin, are all anti um, coagulation uh, cofactors. Then we can also use in the cardiovascular area, which also, again, all these are handling cardiovascular health, improving outcomes, reducing inflammation, the autoimmune aspects of cardiovascular disease. We've got the omega 3 and the vitamin D. A uh, power fuel is a very interesting supplement too, which improves cardiac output. It's got the D-ribose in there, which helps myocardial cells, and uh, of course the acetyl L-carnitine, which is uh, needed just for uh, shuttling or a number of things. But one of them is to shuttle omega threes into cells. Um, and DMG, of course, lots of studies on DMG and cardiovascular function. And then um, the cardiostack we haven't mentioned yet too. But uh, you've got a special form of carnitine in the, the tartarate form, which seems to have an affinity for cardiovascular improvements. Vitamin C basically is in everyone. Who's the only person you're not going to give vitamin C? There may be a couple of answers, but it has to do with their genetics. It's a, people have um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, so G6PD deficiency. So I had a patient a couple months ago, and she came to me. She says, yeah, you know, I, felt, I didn't feel right at this other doctor because, you know, I would get the IV vitamin C, and I would feel really bad. And he kept telling me, I, you know, I was detoxing. I said, well, it could be. It could be. So I do her labs. And uh, but when she said that, I thought of this, and I checked it, and she, she had an abnormally low G6PD. What that means is when those people are exposed to vitamin C, their red blood cells explode. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So they get this a G6PD hemolytic anemic crisis. She's lucky she didn't die on that. And, and just a few weeks later, this particular physician, uh, his license was taken away because he gave three patients hepatitis C. Yep. He can cross-contaminate all those people. So again, with cardiovascular disease, there's no protocol that should continue without vitamin E. You start at 400. Vitamin E is a platelet anti-aggregator, so very good. And of course, a multivitamin with all the activated nutrients that that would have as a baseline. Resveratrol, everyone goes on resveratrol in my practice. There is not a condition that you can name, maybe ingrown toenails, that could not benefit from, uh, someone needs to look that up, from resveratrol. It reduces stiffness of blood vessels. It fixes all the lipids. Um, it is an antioxidant, it's an anti-cancer agent, uh, it detoxifies, but really. So again, PubMed.com, plug it in there, it comes up. You can never, you'll never live long enough to read all the studies. It's, in, it's incredible. So I give that to people. Yes, it's better if you have it in wine. Yeah, but wine has a problem. So, and that whole wine, heart disease, French thing, that was a lie. So that was never true. But it did make us aware of these particular nutrients and what they mean. Um, you can see the rest. I won't review every one of them, except I will say pregnenolone. This one particular study showed that pregnenolone helped decrease subjects' total average cholesterol from 263 to 187. Just that one thing. So if you're dealing with someone who seems to have that adrenal this and chronic that, and you're thinking everything is you know, weak, and the, the, the uh, synthesis of pregnenolone may be low, maybe they're under eating, maybe they're malabsorbing, they're not producing enough, and they have high cholesterol because the body makes the cholesterol to, for uh, the antioxidant you know, effects in this person who's degenerating, you give them some pregnenolone and they, they do really well. I tend to start in the morning, but that can be given throughout the course of the day. Yes? What is the difference in ubiquinone and ubiquinol? Yeah, so ubiquinol, ubiqu ubiquinone here is these are both forms of CoQ10. And ubiquitous means that it's everywhere. So CoQ10 is everywhere in the body. Uh, and ubiquinone is a form that has been probably more studied than any other. Ubiquinol is very exciting as well. So um, I don't believe that uh, Frontiers has that particular form of CoQ10. But they both work. You know, they, they both work. It's, some say that the ubiquinol may be more absorbed. But I haven't seen it. I mean, this works fine for me. Yeah, Doc? Dosing on your pregnenolone? Mm -hmm. 25 milligrams I would start. I would go up to 25, maybe two or three times a day. OK. We do have uh, both forms. You have both forms? Yeah. OK, and what are the products uh, names for those? Uh, power Quinol, Ubiquinol, and then the Ubiquinol is, is Power G. 
Okay. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. We have samples of the chewables here too? Yep. Okay. Okay, great. I'll take them on the plane right home. <laughs> all right. I won't be able to sit straight, but it's all good. Um, more about curcumin and piperine. We're going backwards. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What's that now? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Great. And we talked about natokine plus, this natokinase, and all the other fibrinolytic cofactors here. So everyone with autoimmunity, everyone with cardiovascular disease, most chronic disease increases cardiovascular risk because of the stickiness factor involved, right? There's just stickiness. So this is good stuff. Laboratory considerations, we talked about a lot of these before. Uh, serum ferritin values with inflammation usually are elevated. If you want to know if it's iron, you look at the serum iron, and if it's normal, it's not from iron. Uh, we could say more about that, but that's enough for now. Um, Pernicious anemia, other forms of anemia are create a, a more of a stress on the heart as well. So you want to create, you want to fix uh, anemias. Pernicious anemia is a B12 anemia. So I'm going to put people on folic acid, activated folic acid B12, and B6. Thank you. <laughs>